Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. The first ever time we have done this award, I believe, best domestique of the year. We're going to have get into some definitional questions on that issue as well. What is a domestique? Who knows? I don't really know if it is defined anywhere accurately. This show, as always, is supported by our show partner, LaCole. More on them later. Be with Benji Nyson, as always. What is your understanding of a domestique? Benji being well versed, obviously, in Antonio Nibali, the best domestique ever. Yeah, of course, he's the legend. But looking at the definition of a domestique, I think a lot of people see it in the simplicity of riding at the front of a group or chasing down a group for other people. I think it goes beyond that. I think it's more the definition of a rider that is in the race, mainly for the purpose of having their leader of their team improving their chances of winning. And I'm saying mainly because we have domestiques that start a race as a domestique, but by the end they're not a domestique because something happens. And we will talk about that a little bit further on because I'm going to ask a random question to LR that is completely unprepared. So that's great. And um, yeah, next to that, there's a lot of aspects to that because, like I said, chasing groups, riding at the front, that's one way of helping your leader when they're in a nifty situation, when they need to chase down a group or when they want to pressurize people that are in the same group. But next to that, I think a lot of people overlook, for example, a rider going in the breakaway. Let's say, for example, Kono Hago did in women's preseason. She did that quite a lot in the early season, a few races where she went in the breakaway together with some other teams to make sure that SD Works had to work in the peloton, Shabby. their opposing team. Uh, Shabby as well. Yes, very good uh, notice there that's one of those riders that keeps on doing that then that is doing that solely for the purpose of reducing the competition of their leader that is sitting behind in the peloton with that opposing team that is uh well putting the effort in to try and chill, close down those those gaps but next to that there's also more simple tasks that they do you've got arashiro that for example gets a lot of bottles for his teammates and in a very spectacular way flying past the peloton with the bottles in his hand oh that was great um but yeah everything near that but it, there's also the aspect of reducing the weaknesses of a leader i think because like we talk about cobble stages and ground tours and we talk about about oh, should look after roglic and certain cobble riders should look after this person and just guiding a leader in more comfortable situations or in more uncomfortable situations actually to give them more comfort echelons is the same thing so i said a lot of things do you think these applies to uh to a domestique or do you see other things yeah, they're the main domestic roles as well as, you know, the, the stereotypical is pacing, you know, in, in a mountain. That's the so-called super domestique. And you mentioned the Mads Pedersen role for Richie Port, invaluable for him in the Tour de France 2020. They post a lot about that, actually, Pedersen guiding him around. I think I have to include lead-out men here. It meets the yep. definition of, of, you know, and we're not going to do a separate lead-out man podcast, so it, it has to meet the definition uh, <laughs> for housekeeping. <laughs> so lead-out men have to count. If people delivering, doing a lead-out like Coos for Roglic, you know, in like Vuelta 2020, no, not Vuelta, whenever, when Coos leads out Roglic on a mountain, well, to me that's the same as Michael Mercu as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of different types of domestiques. There's guys who kind of do everything, who go unnoticed, I would say a lot, like Carlos Verona who you see his quality when he gets his own chance on the Alicante stage behind Stora or in the attacking camera in the Catalonia break on Tumán Reza maybe. So, yeah, it's, there's a lot of different types of domestiques. There's, it, it's tough because like Van der Breggen, Benji, she was a great domestique as well. Uh, but yeah. she largely oh, – but we're, for the men's, we're going to stick to riders who largely were domestiques for the year. That was their role rather than like yeah. – Lopez, not really a domestique. Yeah, I get that, certainly. Okay, that's the definitioning done, uh, which maybe we're no closer to the actual answer. Before we get into our <laughs> list, mention our show partner, LaCole. LaCole are going back to the World Tour of Peloton next year. They have a three-year technical kit partnership with Bora Hansgrohe starting in 2022, and they have the fastest skin suits and speed suits around we'll see that on the back of sam bennett next year if you want to check out any of lacole's kit you can see it in the description below at www.lacole.cc thanks to lacole for supporting the podcast all right benji my best domestiques in no particular order i'm just going to scattergun around and we'll see if i've missed any names Jonas rickart mercu 
Castroviejo, Dylan Van Bala, Carlos Verona, Arashiro. Who else am I missing? I've got Martinez. Yes. I've got a weakness for some domestiques, by the way. So I've got a list <laughs> of domestiques as well, including like a Martinez, also a Kuss. And I think those two riders do have a, a weakness that is reducing them from the top spot of my best domestique list. But I've got very similar names. I also had the list of Castroviejo, Mercu, and uh, the Cleric being on here together with Arashiro. And then the question was, do we calculate Caruso as a domestique or not? But we've already basically said that, that that's a rider that started as a domestique, but ended up being more than that. And in the end, basically uh, was a leader for the races he was riding. So in the end, I'm not really counting him as a domestique in my spectrum here. So uh, that's one that falls off. But two names that I'm asking you about is because we spoke about them at the early season because we were kind of on the edge of what we were expecting from them. Mike and Formulo, do you think that they delivered yes i look back at the tour de france footage i think in big moments they did in big moments when i think of liege based on liege formula made an important pull for to set up tere pagaccia yeah. castel fidardo castel fidardo yeah. as well and then tour de france stage eight i went back and looked pre pagaccia's attack ineos have set it up and then formula drilled it on the front before pagaccia attacked then Micah was actually good third week from memory. Uh, at least he was regularly last eight riders from memory, last eight to ten riders, which it's a good effort. So I, I'm actually less concerned by those sort of guys, Benji, as Pagach's help on medium mountain, light medium mountain or crosswind stages, frankly, where there was more problems with the team support. Um, so even Soler and Bennett kind of fixed the don't fix the biggest problem i saw with that team actually you think that the aspect that they had quite a few crashes at the start of the tour might lead to a hirshi or a biatic not being able to give their all on those stages perhaps that's an effect to it i just think yeah again vergas stecklang and no luke rowe and ian stannard that's i just don't think they're as good as those guys i mean they're young guys but yeah i just don't think they're they're as good in tricky situations or even as good as pedersen like pedersen imagine him being your domestic in crosswinds or one up and up these are these are yeah. top top classics riders uh but going through there's another couple of names imanol erviti for movistar loyal domestic to them as well as jose joaquin rojas rojas very versatile uh and the thing i like about erviti and rojas benji is and something that I really, really rate as important, and it applies to Verona as well and Castroviejo, these guys can get over like really hard climbs, long climbs, unless they are done at nuclear GC pace and they can make it to the next valley and help, generally speaking. And I think that is incredibly important in Grand Tours. We saw it in Catalonia in the Calella stage. Verona made it, and we see it in the in the the welter with Rojas as well. Where do you sort of rate? What do you value as more important? A Martinez who can do a last pull on a final steep climb or a Castroviejo who is going to make it over the second last climb and then pace the valley to keep things under control for Bernal? I've got Castroviejo slightly higher because while Martinez is indeed a better climber himself and is very good at motivating Bernal when he's a uh, dropping off the back of the elite group uh he's also got a weakness martinez and it's his descending we've spoken about it quite a few times this season and it's something that is very notable castro has good descending he's able to guide a squad or a leader in his wheel down a hill as well just like uphill he's able to set pace he was one of the better climbers in the dauphine last year by the way everybody keeps forgetting that castro was climbing with the likes of the the big guns there and i was like okay this is crazy but this year we have not seen that nuclear performance on like the biggest climbs by Castro but I feel like he's been a a very strong consistent domestique on every train throughout that Giro and next to that he's able to do two ground tours in a row to also support in the Tour de France now obviously how a GC leader eventually completes the ground tour reflects on their domestiques a bit so the Giro for Castro automatically looks better because Bernal won compared to the Tour de France where Carapaz only podiumed while it's still fantastic result for Carapaz as well I'm like automatically the Giro just looks better for Castro but like to answer your question I, I agree that I see personally Castro somewhat higher than a Martinez 
while Martinez can indeed do that uh, that crazy pull. And that's one of the examples you gave, that stage 20 at the Giro, uh, when Castroviejo was able to get over that San Bernardino climb, and he was able to get over the next climb as well. And then after the second last climb, he was the one that was able to get back to the front as well. So yep. They had to wait for Martinez on the descent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's one of those stages where you're like saying it's multiple mountains, he can get over that. When it's at GC pace, he's probably going to get in trouble, but he's also not the rider that when he gets dropped, he's completely done for. He can try and come back for a later stage. And it also results in other terrains we've seen in, in history of Castro, where he's also good in medium mountain terrain and also in somewhat hilly terrain i personally don't have an example in my head of like a very steep climb he got over and then supported so i can't tell you that but he's versatile that's what i'm trying to say and that's what we see with the most important domestiques in my eyes that they're versatile you've got domestiques like us who are very versatile throughout you've got domestiques that are very specialized in one thing and then we're looking at a merc in my eyes because while he's also able to help in other trains a tiny bit I feel like lead out is his thing and the other things are just not really there. So how would you rate uh, a lead out specialized domestique versus an all rounder versatile domestique in a different terrain? Well, who do you decide? How do you decide who's better? I think this is something I've been grappling with. Who made the most marginal difference to world tour wins this year or wins this year? Was it Merku? Was it Castroviejo? Was it Dylan Van Baal? It has to be Merku, I think. I think Merku is my is my best domestique of the year because I think Ooh. he made the, mo- the biggest marginal difference to race results this year. And frankly, who who would you put as the next best last man in, wor- in the world tour? Is it Consoni? Reluctant to give it to him. Not yeah. Rüdiger Zelig. It's he is so important, and we saw he generated world tour wins with Bennett, Cavendish, Hodge like anyone behind him wins at a, at a higher rate than they do otherwise. And four world tour, four Tour de France stage wins, not all of which he did a great, a perfect job in, but a lot he did. He has to be my biggest contributor to wins as a domestique this year, I think. Castro Viejo, the one thing that stands out in my mind, maybe his level was even better in the Tour de France. He made last, he was in the last five men on Luthardet End. He closed down Pagacha's attack after Pagacha attacked on Luthardet End. He closed it down for Carapaz. Crazy. So I think Castro is incredibly important as well. I have him as my second best domestique of the year. And someone, Benji, on speaking of Ineos, we focus a lot on Ineos. A rider we were lauding last year. He had 56 race days this year with no Grand Tours, which is he had a heavy load before the Tour. Rohan. Andre Amador. Oh, okay. That could be that. <laughs> we would have chosen Rohan Dennis because last year I think he was one of the better domestiques in the Giro, for example. But you're right, Amador. We haven't seen him in a while, have we? Like No Grand Tours. It's kind of sad. Like Amador was also the kind of rider that is also very similar in Castro with the ability of doing very versatile things and also a magnificent descender amador i've seen yep. this this man flying through groups like it's crazy and that versatility was perhaps there but the level just wasn't there this year i think did he have an injury or i don't know i just don't remember him in races he he did and he wasn't as good he did big races benji he did uae Paranese, basque romandy dauphine we watched all those races now oh, romandy big races okay. i didn't watch Oh, yeah, I didn't watch Ron. But I made a pot about it. But I didn't watch it. Um, I don't remember him standing out in those races. In fact, when I look at think about La Planet Dauphiné, I think of Button. Well, but but in do- terms of domestiques, I think Verona, Rojas, Valverde, Erviti no. on on that climb leading it out. So I don't know what happened with that. But well, Dylan Van Baal, he just wasn't. I mean, he's a, he was a great domestique. I think he got. I don't know if he was over raced this year or, or what, but he did two Olympics Vuelta. He was more in an aggressive role at the Vuelta, actually. And I remember in the tour, he got in the break as a satellite rider on stage seven, which Benji sort of mentioned at the top of the podcast, how it is part of a domestique's role to be able to get into breaks uh, as well. But in terms of my, I haven't, I haven't decided on my third best domestique of the year. I think it's Verona, actually, because he just, uh, all that stands out in my mind is, the three Trident leaders looking at him in the valley 
after the last climb in Catalonia and poor old Carl Sferona had to close down every <laughs> day himself. He does the work of three domestiques looking after those guys. And, yeah, I think Verona's a really, really, really good good domestique. So they're my three, Mercu, Castro, Verona. Is there any uh, any disagreement there, Benji? I agree with your with with these riders deserving to be on those on the podium, and I think it's a very defendable take. The ones you are uh, proposed, I've got a, I've got two of the three riders actually the same on the podium, but I've got one rider that is not, and I also don't have the same positions for the riders. So, I guess we uh look at things differently now. But um, my third best rider is a rider we've barely mentioned, but. He was one of my better domestiques in the past, and he's still one of those better domestiques still. But he's also specialized in a task. He's the one that starts riding at the start of the peloton at the start of a race and makes sure that the brake doesn't get away. And in other situations, he goes into breakaways, like in the uh, World Championships, for example, to try and, first of all, calm down Remco Evenepoel, and next to that, also try and pressurize teams in the back, stuff like that, try and put other people in trouble, and that is Tim Leclerc for me. He's one of those riders that has zero shown interest, at least, in being a leader himself. He doesn't use situations to his advantage. And he always looks... Well, he uses he uses situations to the advantage of his team and not to himself. And that's great. I remember that one race. So was it a, a 1.1 or 2.1 race? I don't know what it was. Uh, a Belgian uh, one-day race where he and... Uh, Eve Lampard were attacking together and yeah, some crazy stuff happened. And even in previous years, we've seen him do lots of crazy stuff. And I think Dridax de Pone last year was pretty crazy as well, where he was in that attack where Van der Poel then eventually, uh, was it, did he fall, Van der Poel? I really recall, uh, recall him falling during a race last year and uh, that was in a, an echelon race with a group of five that was still left in the end. But yeah, we're talking about this year, of course, and I think Tim Declerc is still one of those riders. And it also builds into the aspect of getting your leader to the finish line when he's not exactly the best climber. And that's where Cavendish is uh, is definitely a, an argument because Declerc was always by his side every single time that your boy Cav was uh, dropping off the back of the peloton and was trying to finish in the green jersey in the Tour de France. And I think supporting your leader just while you're suffering yourself mentally supporting your leader at the back of the race is also something that is very difficult i think and we've heard Merku talk about it and that is my second spot <laughs> that's why i gave points to Merku. yeah because he, he he's master of it that de Koenig squad needs credit for getting cav through the time cuts yeah and additionally i feel like Merku has an extra thing where he is able to adapt to the leader that he has so for example in the situation that we just spoke about being at the back of the race trying to get your leader to the finish line We've got Cavendish that, according to Merck, who is a harder person to motivate to get to the finish line because he's suffering and, as a consequence, complaining that he's suffering. And Merck, who has to adapt to that and try and motivate him to get him to the line. While he said that with other sprinters, like a Bennett, for example, that was less of a... The motivating was less necessary because that seemed to flow better, just like that. And then towards normal sprints, you see him adapt as well because... We've seen situations where he literally mid-sprint changes what he's doing completely according to whether his sprinter is uh, able to follow him or whether his sprint is able to, uh, well, do what he's f thinking that the sprinter should be doing. Because we saw last year Bennett uh, lost the wheel of Merku, for example, and the second that he started trusting Merku uh, in Merku's abilities, it worked out better and better and... I think Merck who adapts at the end of sprints as well, where he either needs to choose between bringing out the lead out versus bringing out uh, the sprinter or bringing the sprinter to the last 200 meters. Like in the last three kilometers, he decides all this stuff and then places it perfectly. And by the end of the race, it's categorically a better chance of his sprinter winning than anyone else because he's able to adapt to the situation that his sprint is in in the, uh, in the sprint. Did that make sense at all, my explanation? I think his favorite man to lead out is Bennett. I think Merku likes Bennett more than Cavendish. Just completely I think so as well. subjective, just based on the way he speaks about the various riders, and he seemed to like Bennett. I could probably just make that up. Viviani, as he said as well, that he literally didn't have to speak to Viviani. I have a question. Yes. 
So a lot of people talk about Merck when, when we start discussing the best sprinters in the world. People tend to sometimes name Merku as one of the best sprinters because he can get second behind his main sprinter. He can get second behind Cavendish in a sprint, in a, an intermediate sprint. Do you think that if you put Merku at the back of a train, he would be a good sprinter? My answer, no, because he won't have Merku as a lead out. Uh, I think he can win World Tour races, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. He came second in the Tour stage, fourth and third in UAE, fifth in Elfstead and Ronda. I think he could snag a World Tour race. Uh, he, he's not going to be – yeah, I think he, his positioning is so good. I don't know. Maybe maybe he doesn't have that snap and he's more like a steady 15, 20 seconds or maybe a bit longer. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I think he could win. But he's – that's firmly his role. I, I'm always surprised that people don't be – I think he extended with De Koenig for another two years. Like yeah. if you're paying Caleb bucket loads and then it's like putting uh, – getting a Ferrari and putting putting cheap petrol in it, right? Like what's – you've got to have the lead out, man. It's essential. But Is there a difference between petrol? I didn't know that. <laughs> what do you mean? There's, there's like better quality petrol. Benji I didn't know that. Benji obviously doesn't have a supercar, <laughs> fake YouTuber. <laughs> One lead-out man I want to mention, and I, I, I'd be remiss not to mention, or two actually, the Jonas Ricard I thought was really good, and I remember him leading MVP back to the group at Paris Bay. Sticks out in my mind. Another one is Marco Haller. He just took a three-year deal at Bora Hans Grower. Poor guy, Dauphiné, was chasing with 58 kilo Butrago on the flats, chasing Bren van Moeder and Lucas Postelberger all day. He's a solid lead-out man. He can do also the Tim de Klerk style role. He's a good classics domestique. I think as an all round domestique, he's really I really want to mention him there, as opposed to like a Nathan Van Hoydonk. It's just like different quality, you know, between those sort of domestiques, Haller versus versus a Van Hoydonk. And I think that's why you see that even Siemens at Yumbo Visma said like our classic support for Wout wasn't good enough. We had to reload with Laporte and Van der Sander. But but Yumbo Benji, we haven't really mentioned any of their their riders, maybe we haven't you haven't mentioned Coos. Why, why is Coos not sniffing your top three or five? My Coos is in my top ten, certainly. I haven't really decided the position that he's in, but while he is there at very important moments throughout the year, he's also sometimes not there when it's a very important moment. He lacks consistency throughout a Grand Tour, for example, and therefore I can't 100% trust that he's going to be there on every situation that Roglic is going to need him. And we saw that, for example, in Formigal Vuelta last year, where the team was kind of falling apart right there. But in his this year, when something goes wrong, Roglic needs to have people that he can trust on that can try and prevent the situation that they are put in from becoming a time loss at the end of the stage and on multiple multiple situations now in the last year and we can even extend that to a year and a half we've noticed that that is not the case there and that's one of the reasons that I've got because outside of that top three and also next to that that I've in the same way feel like he has similar qualities in being a good climber but also similar downsides as Roglic in that chaotic situation when it goes wrong they are both in trouble and therefore they don't feel compatible with each other to be able to fix that situation you know yeah i think just reliability is important and he doesn't have the reliability as a domestique to be the top top level of domestiques despite if you want to shred a group and reduce it to even like four guys three guys he can do that which is also that's still very, very important, but it's more on the de- on the defensive. Is he reliable? I think of Von Two, or not even Von Two, on the aggress- aggressive Von Two stage of the tour, he wasn't there for Jonas. He lost so much time and couldn't help Vingegaard, who was on good form that day. This is something Dowsett mentioned, Benji, in his interview about how domestiques get judged, and you mentioned it with Castro Giro. Domestiques get judged based on whether their leaders are good enough to actually get the result. Luca Mez gets bike exchange. Is he a top tier domestique? And he just doesn't have the people behind him to finish it off. I mean, I think of a lot of the work he did this year, 66 race days. He even got fourth in a fourth in Champs Elysees sprint, fourth in Welt of Welter stage as well. Is Mez gets actually could he is he a top quality last man? 
should he not be the sprinter? That we've <laughs> we've spoken about yeah. that the entire year when Matthews was failing to uh dive into the first position in a sprint and we noticed that throughout the year. And is that a question that we should ask? Yes, but then I saw a video by Bike Exchange on their YouTube or, or Twitter or whatever, where Mezgaj was simply saying in the camera, I want to do this work. And yeah, I um, it's hard to know whether he actually wants to do that or he's doing it for the content. But in, in all honesty, I um, I think that he could be a sprinter if he wants to. But when it comes to his uh, work for other people, he is good on his day. But I'm not sure whether I've analyzed his career or his year so far enough to be able to say that he's consistent or reliable for the long period of time. I'm I'm not sure I can say whether he was reliable for the Velta unless I rewatched the Velta, to be honest. Other riders who are sort of great in a breakaway with teammates, I want to give a shout out. And often often I just remember one moment from a domestique and maybe it's so <laughs> hard to know. It's so hard to know because sometimes their work is done off camera before mm-hmm. live coverage even starts. But Julien Bernard in a couple of stages at the Tour de France really impressed me in breaks with Mollema, uh, doing some of the hard work there, establishing those breaks. Um, but, yeah, as I said, my list is Mercu, Castroviejo, Verona, very honourable mentions being Dylan van Baal uh, and Haller uh, as well. Producer, have I missed any many important names? Yeah. Yeah, again, moments for Jens Kukalera, great moment. Lawson Craddock, great moment. Yep. I just, not the consistency across the year and changing results like those those other guys. So what's your final domestique ranking, Benji? I had the Clerk in third, Mirko in second, and Castro in first because Castro was able to perform that for two Grand Tours in a row. One of the strongest reliability performances throughout a Grand Tour for a leader. And he's almost always there when he needs to be there. And that's what you need from a domestique. And what do you think about riders like an Arashiro? We've spoken about him quite a few times during, I think it was the, uh, was it the Vuelta or the Tour? Yeah, Vuelta. Tour. Vuelta, okay. Where he was the rider that was doing, well, the shitty job is what spectators would say of getting balls every time. But someone needs to do it. And if you can do it in a in a way where you're literally helping your team throughout, and it's not the only thing he did, because then we saw that he was launching Caruso in useless attacks and stages, where he is often judged on the way that Caruso was stupidly attacking to breakaways that are already kind of gone. And um, next to that, like he was also launching Landa in that one stage where he decided to abandon and not become the best domestique of the year award because he stepped out of the Vuelta while still having the energy to go into a DD tank. So uh, Landa's not the best domestique of the year, that's for sure. <laughs> not even a good teammate. I mean, yeah, the world is an interesting one where you have someone like Gino Maida. Am I going to put him in my domestique of the year categories? Like he he, he, he put Haig on the podium from stage 20 and pacing on Covadonga and Gamonateru when Haig was mm-hmm. getting dropped. But he's largely a leader uh, correctly for the rest of the year. So again, uh not someone I, I got a hot take, Benji. I think Tim DeClerc's overrated. Like Oof. Yeah, I think his job is more replaceable than someone like Mercu, someone like Castro Viejo. Finding a guy who can climb as well as Castro or Verona or as versatile as Haller or Van Baal, who are willing to ride in that domestique role and be fully committed, is more difficult to find at a decent price. And a six foot five, six foot six guy who just wants to ride 400 watts on the front all day because, as I said, I mean, he's good to clerk. I'm just saying, I can't, I could find, I reckon you could find someone else to do that job on the front uh, more Ooh. easily. Walshied? Walshied. They might not be as good, but yeah, I think brake management can be taught. Uh, Justin Wolf at Bike Aid. Uh, again, as I said, it might not be as good. I just don't think it's as important or determinative mm-hmm. of actually I get winning that. races. Defendable take. I've got a question for you. Which team, in general, feels like they have the best domestiques? Because we're talking about the Koenig having the likes of a Merck when the Clerk being high up, the Clerk overrated in your eyes, but hey, okay. And then Ineos has Castro and Martinez. You think that there's a team out there that is just performing better domestique wise, or do you think that it's just certain riders on certain teams? I mean, Ineos generally can get guys 
generally, unless it's for carapaz, can get some line of the quality of the <laughs> Peacock pe- Civicol. We haven't mentioned Puccio. Should mention him. Yeah, certainly. To ride as domestiques or, or Martino. Martino is literally won the Dauphiné at EF last year and for, you know, rode as domestique for Bernal this year, although I, I still think he was holding something back on those pools to maintain his own GC position. But um, I, I think Ineos get a good – get guys to work as domestiques well, except they sell Carapaz out every year and they just send him an absolute shit show with him. Like Car- the, the support for Carapaz at the Tour was a disgrace. and. Yep. And it was in the world to 2020 as well. And I hope at the Giro next year, if he goes, he should go. He gets uh, decent support. So uh, it depends. I mean, Thomas and Port, as Domestique's just not there. I mean, Port is okay for Thomas, but will he ride as Domestique for Carapaz? I don't know. I mean, Carapaz is the guy at Catalonia who rode as Domestique for those guys. No problem. Full commitment for Yates, Port, and Thomas. And he didn't really see Would he do it at the Vuelta for Bernal? Would he do it at the Vuelta? Did he do it at the Vuelta for Bernal? Because of, I re- recall us judging him based on his domestic performance, Carapaz at the Vuelta. True, true. But I'm giving him a completely, he DNF'd, he just won the Olympics, okay. got sent in bad shape to the Vuelta. Again, the Vuelta, they had, yeah, like it was interesting. They sent Pidcock when he wasn't in great shape. And Car- I mean, if I was Carapaz, I'm not, fuck no, am I going to, <laughs> work for three weeks after the support he had at the Tour de France. Like, no way. Uh, but, yeah, I'm interesting to see what will happen with Ineos uh, next year. Who do you think has the best domestiques? Because Yumbo, Kreuzweig was actually okay in the Vuelta. Yumbo, it's Hersink, Kreuzweig, Kuz. It's all right, but not maybe the top, top. UAE uh, maybe a little bit underrated, but I still don't think you're great. I don't know. It's pretty balanced across the board. Yeah, I think if we if we saw Yumbo at their full force during the Tour de France, I think we would have had a different idea of certain riders, perhaps because would have shown more consistency there. Because he technically his Vuelta was the second Grand Tour that he did, you know. So um, perhaps if that was the Tour de France, that his main goal was on paper at the start of the season, perhaps his form there would have given him more consistency, and perhaps with Wout van Aert, we would have seen more as a domestique as well, because. I don't know, would he have been trained fully if Roglic stayed on his bike? That's a question we <laughs> don't know the answer to. But I do know that based on what we've seen from Wout van Aert in the last two Tour de France's, he can be one of the better domestiques in the world because he's very versatile on different terrains, much like uh, Castro Viejo. We saw it last year in the Tour de France during that Porto Ballet stage, one of the strongest climbers there, Mondegual, also climbing towards the end. And... He's able to do that in all different terrains. Was it stage 19 or 19 it was uh, last year where they had the uh, stage with Plateau de Glier and so forth where he came, was it fat? So all that stuff is is helpful and he's got the TT also to be able to support just like Castro does. So I think the problem there is that Fanat has won more races and therefore he is much harder to chain than a Castro Viejo when talking about chains. You think that Quiat would deserve a top 10 place if the Tour de France looked better or was his domestique performance at the Tour de France not good enough? I mean, he did the lead out on Von 2 for Carapaz that didn't really go anywhere. I, mm, Liège and Flesh, he was prominent. He, and Amstel Gold Race, he was making the group with Pidcock at Amstel. He's a top domestique, has to be an honourable mention. He did seem to take a step back this year, but was that more in a – like was it in Strade? Did he do a good job for Bernal? Maybe mm-hmm. he's just taken a step back in terms of his own results, particularly Polonia was quite disappointing, and that's influencing my perception of his ability as a domestique, which largely was still very good, still m- well above average as a domestique. Um, yeah. By the way, um, Montalcino Ghana is one I forgot to talk about. He was very prominent there, very active also on the uh, plateau echelon mid-mountain event that we had in the jail. I don't know what to call it at this point, mountain echelons. <laughs> but uh, he was also very active there. And I think throughout the stages as well, he was pacing. But what he has not shown me, Ghana, this year, and we saw it last year a bit more on the stage that Dennis went haywire, stage 19 of uh, the Giro d'Italia last year 
where they were on the Stelvio. Gano was riding quite a bit at the start of that Stelvio. And throughout the middle, Dennis was taking over and totally uh, killing everybody except his two leaders. Or actually, perhaps if he climbed harder, he might have dropped them. But um, looking at it this year, did we expect more from Gana in climbing based on that Stelvio performance? Or do you expect that to change into a situation where he can take up a role like Dennis did last year at the Giro? Or is that too much for him? No, he can't climb like Dennis. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm interested to see his program next year, actually, Ganna. But I think Ganna can be good. I saw at UAE this year, I I liked what I saw keeping Yates safe into the last three Ks of the sprint stages. I think that's something evidently he has the power to do. So I'd like to see Ghana doing that role in the Tour de France, actually, and maybe Luke Rowe doesn't go to the Tour next year, but then there's crosswinds and it's technical, so you might want Rowe. But, yeah, Ghana, I think, can develop into a more broader domestique where he can protect in the last up to the last 3K mark and pass there, which is so important. You know, you might have a leader who can do 0.15 watts per kilo more over 30 minutes and therefore will gain 12 to 15 seconds on a climb or whatever. But if they're going to crash out, on a stand, oh, you know, they got, if they've got a 5% risk of crashing every sprint mm-hmm. stage, that's a problem. And Gana Rowe, et cetera, do a, you know, do a much better job of that than Jumbo Visma. Like that's a basic GC, except for Adam Yates, but that's the Adam Yates problem um, in my view. And that's a basic <laughs> thing that Ineos get right. Yeah, and Jumbo don't and Pagacha kind of just – I don't know, he just looks after himself pretty much. Um, so, yeah, Ghana can do that. Climbing, though, don't see it. Uh, I'm really interested to see how the Giro and Tour starts go next year regarding regarding Ghana uh, as well and Van Aert and everybody. I just can't wait for the racing next year. But I'm sure people will have honourable mentions that we've not included. They'll not agree with our, our top three domestiques in male cycling across the year. Any final thoughts on on domestiques, Benji, and who you think will really step up to maybe be top tier, either mountain, lead out, et cetera, uh, next year? I think Haller for Bennett is going to get noticed a lot. I hope he does because I, I do uh, kind of like what Haller is doing. And next to that, I want to see what Freyla does for Ineos next season after his transfer. Um, the problem with Freyla and Naramburu, for example, is that they have been domestiques. We've seen Freyla do stuff in the sense, Aramburu do stuff in the sense on climbs. But the problem is that their leader was never good enough in the races that they did it. So they've not been able to get that respect that another leader perhaps would have, well, eventually ruled for them. For example, if they do the work that they do for Roglic during that Itzulia stage, for example, instead of Izagire, then their performance looks more credited because the team that came out on top in that stage was not Astana. And as a consequence, people credit Yumbo a lot for the work that happened in that Atsuya stage to split up the group. They didn't do anything. <laughs> and Astana was the group that uh, the team that did it. So that's the aspect there that I'm curious what these riders will do in other teams. I'm curious what a rider like Freyla will do in Ineos. And that's also an aspect of the domestique on one end needing to be on one end it needs to fill the issues that a leader has and on the other end it needs to make sure that their strengths are not too strong for their leader for example Thrilo went haywire on a descent went crazy on a descent and lopez rode into a sign as a consequence so <laughs> that's yeah. an example of a advice. non-compatible sorry what no advice did nine watts per kilo for a minute and dropped Adam Yates on uh, the Cuyera stage of the Vuelta and stuffed yep. Bernal. He pulled way too hard. So that's a problem. Freyla is the Moscon replacement. I think pretty uh, – that seems how I'm reading it, and I think he'll be very, very, very good over there. As a final question, is Moscon now free at Astana or will he domestique for the one and only legend, Sharko Nibali? <laughs> you have to let Moscow and hunt stage of the Giro next year. <laughs> like, Bertiol better be freed as well. So Moscow and a uh, different team, obviously, but the stages suit those type of guys. And sorry, sorry, Vincenzo, but Aww. he can be a satellite rider. And, oh, I just happened to get <laughs> five minutes. Satellite rider. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a satellite rider. Oops, I won the stage. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like we're doing it at the Joe Finesse stage. <laughs> I'm two minutes ahead. Um, so, yeah, Most Gone should be free, uh, I would say. And that surely, surely is part of the reason. Maybe Ineos didn't want to re-sign him. But, um, yeah, that's part of the reason he went to Astana, one would think. Uh, but, yeah, I can't wait. Can't wait to see next year. I love watching the Domestique watch. Can you just see? I think Coos, to be honest, is still going for, like, stage hunting leadership and then occasionally will do, like, hard pulls at the end of back end of a grand tour but yeah domestiques are important teammates often undervalued and we hope you enjoyed this podcast dedicated to the domestiques let us know your top three lists of domestiques this year as well as most memorable or important domestique performance in terms of race changing results mine is castro giro stage 20 i can't forget it it's more important than what martinez did in terms of saving time for banal against caruso We're going to end on that note. Like the video down below and we'll see you in the next one. Ciao.